Chapter 81. The Pequod Meets the Virgin. The predestinated day arrived, and we duly met the ship Jungfrau, Derek de Der, master of Bremen. At one time the greatest whaling people in the world, the Dutch and Germans are now among the least, but here and there, at very wide intervals of latitude and longitude, you still occasionally meet with their flag in the Pacific. For some reason, the Jungfrau seemed quite eager to pay her respects, while yet some distance from the Pequod she rounded to, and dropping a boat, her captain was impelled toward us, impatiently standing in the bows instead of the stern. "'What has he in his hand there?' cried Starbuck pointing to something wavingly held by the German. Impossible! A lamp-feeder! Not that, said Stubb. No, no, it's a coffee-pot, Mr. Starbuck. He's coming off to make us our coffee, is the Yarman. Don't you see that big tin can of there alongside of him? That's his boiling water. Oh, he's all right, is the Yarman. Get along with you, cried Flask. It's a lamp-feeder and an oil-can. He's out of oil, and has come a-begging. However curious it may seem for an oil-ship to be borrowing oil on the whale-ground, and however much it may inadvertently contradict the old proverb about carrying coals to Newcastle, yet sometimes such a thing really happens, and in the present case Captain Derek de Dare did indubitably conduct a lamp-feeder, as Flask did declare. As he mounted the deck, Ahab abruptly accosted him, without at all heeding what he had in his hand, but in his broken lingo the German soon evinced his complete ignorance of the white whale, immediately turning the conversation to his lamp-feeder and oil-can, with some remarks touching his having to turn into his hammock at night in profound darkness, his last drop of Bremen oil being gone, and not a single flying fish yet captured to supply the deficiency, concluding by hinting that his ship was indeed what in the fishery is technically called a clean one, that is, an empty one, well deserving the name of Jungfrau, or the Virgin. His necessities supplied, Derek departed, but he had not gained his ship's side when whales were almost simultaneously raised from the mastheads of both vessels, and so eager for the chase was Derrick, that without pausing to put his oil-can and lamp-feeder aboard, he slewed round his boat, and made after the leviathan lamp-feeders. Now the game having risen to the leeward, he and the other three German boats that soon followed him, had considerably the start of the Pequod's keels. There were eight whales, an average pod, Aware of their danger, they were going all abreast with great speed straight before the wind, rubbing their flanks as closely as so many spans of horses in harness. They left a great wide wake, as though continually unrolling a great wide parchment upon the sea. Full in this rapid wake, and many fathoms in the rear, swam a huge humped old bull, which, by his comparatively slow progress, as well as by the unusual yellowish incrustations overgrowing him, seemed afflicted with the jaundice, or some other infirmity. Whether this whale belonged to the pod in advance seemed questionable, for it is not customary for such venerable leviathans to be at all social. Nevertheless he stuck to their wake, though indeed their backwater must have retarded him, because the white bone or swell at his broad muzzle was a dashed one, like the swell formed when two hostile currents meet. His spout was short, slow, and laborious, coming forth with a choking sort of gush, and spending itself in torn shreds, followed by strange subterranean commotions in him, which seemed to have egress at his other buried extremity, causing the waters behind him to up-bubble. "'Who's got some paragoric?' said Stubb. "'He has the stomach-ache, I'm afraid. Lord, think of having half an acre of stomach-ache. Adverse winds are holding mad Christmas in him, boys. It's the first foul wind I ever knew to blow from astern. But look, did ever whale yaw so before?' It must be he's lost his tiller. 
as an overladen Indiaman bearing down the Hindustan coast with a deck load of frightened horses, careens, berries, rolls, and wallows on her way, so did this old whale heave his aged bulk, and now and then, partly turning over on his cumbrous rib-ends, expose the cause of his devious wake in the unnatural stump of his starboard fin. Whether he had lost that fin in battle, or had been born without it, it were hard to say. "'Only wait a bit, old chap, and I'll give you a sling for that wounded arm,' cried Cruel Flask, pointing to the whale-line near him. "'Mind he don't sling thee with it,' cried Starbuck. "'Give way, or the German will have him.' With one intent, all the combined rival boats were pointed for this one fish, because not only was he the largest and therefore the most valuable whale, but he was nearest to them, and the other whales were going with such great velocity, moreover, as almost to defy pursuit for the time. At this juncture the Pequod's keels had shot by the three German boats last lowered, but from the great start he had had, Derrick's boat still led the chase, though every moment neared by his foreign rivals. The only thing they feared was that, from being already so nigh to his mark, he would be enabled to dart his iron before they could completely overtake and pass him. As for Derrick, he seemed quite confident that this would be the case, and occasionally, with a deriding gesture, shook his lamp-feeder at the other boats. "'The ungracious and ungrateful dog!' cried Starbuck. He mocks and dares me with the very poor box I filled for him not five minutes ago. Then, in his old intense whisper, Give way, greyhounds, dog to it. I tell you what it is, men, cried Stubb to his crew. It's against my religion to get mad, but I'd like to eat that villainous yarman. Pull, won't you? Are you going to let that rascal beat you? Do you love brandy? A hogshead of brandy, then, to the best man. Come, why don't some of you burst a blood vessel? Who's that been dropping an anchor overboard? We don't budge an inch. We're becalmed. Halloo, here's grass growing in the boat's bottom, and by the Lord, the mast there, budding. This won't do, boys. Look at that yarman. The short and long of it is, men. Will you spit fire or not? Oh, see the suds he makes, cried Flask, dancing up and down. What a hump! Oh, do pile on the beef! lays like a log oh my lads do spring slapjacks and quahogs for supper you know my lads baked clams and muffins oh do do spring he's a hundred barreler don't lose him now oh don't don't see that yarman oh won't you pull for your duff my lads such a sog such a sogger don't you love sperm there goes three thousand dollars men a bank a whole bank the bank of england oh do 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 what's that yarman about now at this moment derrick was in the act of pitching his lamp feeder at the advancing boats and also his oil can perhaps with the double view of retarding his rival's way and at the same time economically accelerating his own by the momentary impetus of the backward toss the unmannerly dutch dogger cried stubb pull now men like fifty thousand line of battleship loads of red-haired devils what do you say tashtego are you the man to snap your spine in two and twenty pieces for the honour of old gayhead what do you say i say pull like goddam cried the indian fiercely but evenly incited by the taunts of the german the pequod's three boats now began ranging almost abreast and so disposed, momentarily neared him. In that fine, loose, chivalrous attitude of the headsman, when drawing near to his prey, the three mates stood up proudly, occasionally backing the after oarsman with an exhilarating cry of, There she slides now! Hurrah for the white ash breeze! Down with the yarman! Sail over him! But so decided an original start had Derrick had, that spite of all their gallantry he would have proved the victor in this race had not a righteous judgment descended upon him in a crab which caught the blade of his midship oarsman while this clumsy lubber was striving to free his white ash and while in consequence derrick's boat was nigh to capsizing 
and he thundering away at his men in a mighty rage, that was a good time for Starbuck, Stubb, and Flask. With a shout, they took a mortal start forward, and slantingly ranged up on the German's quarter. An instant more, and all four boats were diagonally in the whale's immediate wake, while stretching from them on both sides was the foaming swell that he made. It was a terrific, most pitiable, and maddening sight. The whale was now going head out, and sending his spout before him in a continual tormented jet, while his one poor fin beat his side in an agony of fright. Now to this hand, now to that, he yawed in his faltering flight, and still at every billow that he broke he spasmodically sank in the sea, or sideways rolled towards the sky his one beating fin. So have I seen a bird with clipped wing making affrighted broken circles in the air, vainly striving to escape the piratical hawks. But the bird has a voice, and with plaintive cries will make known her fear. But the fear of this vast dumb brute of the sea was chained up and enchanted in him. He had no voice, save that choking respiration through his spiracle, and this made the sight of him unspeakably pitiable while still in his amazing bulk portcullis jaw and omnipotent tail there was enough to appall the stoutest man who so pitied seeing now that but a very few moments more would give the pequod's boats the advantage and rather than be thus foiled of his game derrick chose to hazard what to him must have seemed a most unusually long dart ere the last chance would forever escape but no sooner did his harpooner stand up for the stroke than all three tigers, Queequeg, Tashtego, and Dagoo, instinctively sprang to their feet, and standing in a diagonal row, simultaneously pointed their barbs, and darted over the head of the German harpooner their three Nantucket irons entered the whale. Blinding vapors of foam and white fire, the three boats, in the first fury of the whale's headlong rush, bumped the Germans aside with such force that both Derrick and his baffled harpooner were spilled out and sailed over by the three flying keels. "'Don't be afraid, my butter-boxes!' cried Stubb, casting a passing glance upon them as he shot by. "'You'll be picked up presently. All right. I saw some sharks astern, St. Bernard's dogs, you know. Relieve distressed travellers!' Hurrah! This is the way to sail now, every keel a sunbeam. Hurrah! Here we go like three tin kettles at the tail of a mad cougar. This puts me in mind of fastening to an elephant in a tilbury on a plain. Makes the wheel spokes fly, boys, when you fasten to him that way. And there's danger of being pitched out, too, when you strike a hill. Hurrah! This is the way a fellow feels when he's going to Davy Jones. All a rush down an endless inclined plain. Hurrah! This whale carries the everlasting mail. But the monster's run was a brief one. Giving a sudden gasp, he tumultuously sounded. With a grating rush, the three lines flew round the loggerheads with such force as to gouge deep grooves in them, while so fearful were the harpooners that this rapid sounding would soon exhaust the lines that, using all their dexterous might, they caught repeated smoking turns with the rope to hold on, till at last, owing to the perpendicular strain from the lead-lined chocks of the boats, whence the three ropes went straight down into the blue, the gunwales of the bows were almost even with the water, while the three sterns were tilted high in the air. And the whale soon ceasing to sound, for some time they remained in that attitude, fearful of expending more line, though the position was a little ticklish, but though boats have been taken down and lost in this way, yet it is this holding on, as it is called, this hooking up by the sharp barbs of his live flesh from the back, this it is that often torments the leviathan into soon rising again to meet the sharp lance of his foes. Yet not to speak of the peril of the thing, it is to be doubted whether this course is always the best, for it is but reasonable to presume that the longer the stricken whale stays under water, the more he is exhausted, because, owing to the enormous surface of him, in a full-grown sperm-whale something less than two thousand square feet, the pressure of the water is immense. We all know what an astonishing atmospheric weight we ourselves stand up under, 
even here above ground in the air. How vast, then, the burden of a whale, bearing on his back a column of two hundred fathoms of ocean! It must at least equal the weight of fifty atmospheres. One whaleman has estimated it at the weight of twenty line of battleships, with all their guns and stores and men on board. As the three boats lay there on that gently rolling sea, gazing down into its eternal blue noon, and as not a single groan or cry of any sort, nay, not so much as a ripple or a bubble, came up from its depths, what landsman would have thought that beneath all that silence and placidity the utmost monster of the seas was writhing and wrenching in agony? Not eight inches of perpendicular rope were visible at the bows. Seems it credible that by three such thin threads the great leviathan was suspended like the big weight to an eight-day clock? suspended and to what to three bits of board is this the creature of whom it was once so triumphantly said canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons or his head with fish spears the sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold the spear the dart nor the habergeon he esteemeth iron as straw the arrow cannot make him flee darts are counted as stubble he laugheth at the shaking of a spear this the creature this he oh that unfulfilment should follow the prophets for with the strength of a thousand thighs in his tail leviathan had run his head under the mountains of the sea to hide him from the pequod's fish spears in that sloping afternoon sunlight the shadows that the three boats sent down beneath the surface must have been long enough and broad enough to shade half xerxes army who can tell how appalling to the wounded whale must have been such huge phantoms flitting over his head? "'Stand by, men! He stirs!' cried Starbuck, as the three lines suddenly vibrated in the water, distinctly conducting upwards to them, as by magnetic wires, the life and death throbs of the whale, so that every oarsman felt them in his seat. The next moment, relieved in great part from the downward strain at the bows, the boats gave a sudden bounce upward, as a small ice-field will, when a dense herd of white bears are scared from it into the sea. "'Haul in! Haul in!' cried Starbuck again. "'He's rising!' The lines, of which hardly an instant before not one hand's breadth could have been gained, were now in long, quick coils flung back, all dripping into the boats, and soon the whale broke water within two ship's lengths of the hunters. His motions plainly denoted his extreme exhaustion. In most land animals there are certain valves or floodgates in many of their veins, whereby, when wounded, the blood is, in some degree at least, instantly shut off in certain directions. Not so with the whale, one of whose peculiarities it is to have an entire non-valvular structure of the blood vessels so that when pierced even by so small a point as a harpoon, a deadly drain is at once begun upon his whole arterial system, and when this is heightened by the extraordinary pressure of water at a great distance below the surface, his life may be said to pour from him in incessant streams. Yet so vast is the quantity of blood in him, and so distant and numerous its interior fountains, that he will keep thus bleeding and bleeding for a considerable period, even as in a drought a river will flow, whose source is in the well-springs of far-off and undiscernible hills. Even now, when the boats pulled upon the whale, and perilously drew over his swaying flukes, and the lances were darted into him, they were followed by steady jets from the new-made wound, which kept continually playing, while the natural spout-hole in his head was only at intervals, however rapid, sending its affrighted moisture into the air. From this last vent no blood yet came, because no vital part of him had thus far been struck. His life, as they significantly call it, was untouched. As the boats now more closely surrounded him, the whole upper part of his form, with much of it that is ordinarily submerged, was plainly revealed. His eyes, or rather the places where his eyes had been, were beheld as strange misgrown masses gather in the knot-holes of the noblest oaks when prostrate, so from the points which the whale's eyes had once occupied now protruded blind bulbs, horribly pitiable to see. 
but pity there was none. For all his old age, and his one arm, and his blind eyes, he must die the death and be murdered in order to light the gay bridles and other merry-makings of men, and also to illuminate the solemn churches that preach unconditional inoffensiveness by all to all. Still rolling in his blood, at last he partially disclosed a strangely discoloured bunch or protuberance the size of a bushel, low down on the flank. "'A nice spot!' cried Flask. "'Just let me prick him there once.' "'Avast!' cried Starbuck. "'There's no need of that.' But humane Starbuck was too late. At the instant of the dart, an ulcerous jet shot from this cruel wound, and goaded by it into more than sufferable anguish, the whale, now spouting thick blood with swift fury, blindly darted at the craft, bespattering them and their glorying crews all over with showers of gore, capsizing Flask's boat, and marring the bows. It was his death-stroke for by this time so spent was he by loss of blood that he helplessly rolled away from the wreck he had made, lay panting on his side, impotently flapped with his stumped fin, then over and over slowly revolved like a waning world, turned up the white secrets of his belly, lay like a log, and died. It was most piteous, that last expiring spout, as when by unseen hands the water is gradually drawn off from some mighty fountain, and with half-stifled melancholy gurglings the spray column lowers and lowers to the ground, so the last long dying spout of the whale. Soon, while the crews were awaiting the arrival of the ship, the body showed symptoms of sinking with all its treasures unrifled, Immediately, by Starbuck's orders, lines were secured to it at different points, so that ere long every boat was a buoy, the sunken whale being suspended a few inches beneath them by the cords. By very heedful management, when the ship drew nigh, the whale was transferred to her side, and was strongly secured there by the stiffest fluke chains, for it was plain that unless artificially upheld, the body would at once sink to the bottom. It so chanced that almost upon first cutting into him with the spade, the entire length of a corroded harpoon was found embedded in his flesh, on the lower part of the bunch before described. But as the stumps of harpoons are frequently found in the dead bodies of captured whales, with the flesh perfectly healed around them, and no prominence of any kind to denote their place, Therefore there must needs have been some other unknown reason in the present case fully to account for the ulceration alluded to. But still more curious was the fact of a lance-head of stone being found in him, not far from the buried iron, the flesh perfectly firm about it. Who had darted that stone lance, and when? It might have been darted by some Norwest Indian long before America was discovered. What other marvels might have been rummaged out of this monstrous cabinet there is no telling, but a sudden stop was put to further discoveries by the ships being unprecedentedly dragged over sideways to the sea, owing to the body's immensely increasing tendency to sink. However, Starbuck, who had the ordering of affairs, hung on to it to the last, hung on to it so resolutely indeed that when at length the ship would have been capsized if still persisting in locking arms with the body, then when the command was given to break clear from it, such was the immovable strain upon the timber-heads to which the fluke chains and cables were fastened, that it was impossible to cast them off. Meantime everything in the Pequod was a slant. To cross to the other side of the deck was like walking up the steep gabled roof of a house. The ship groaned and gasped, Many of the ivory inlayings of her bulwarks and cabins were started from their places by the unnatural dislocation. In vain handspikes and crows were brought to bear upon the immovable fluke chains to pry them adrift from the timberheads, and so low had the whale now settled that the submerged ends could not be at all approached, while every moment whole tons of ponderosity seemed added to the sinking bulk, and the ship seemed on the point of going over. "'Hold on! Hold on, won't ye?' cried Stubb to the body. "'Don't be in such a devil of a hurry to sink. By thunder, men, we must do something or go for it. 
no use prying there avast i say with your handspikes and run one of you for a prayer book and a penknife and cut the big chains knife ay ay cried queequeg and seizing the carpenter's heavy hatchet he leaned out of a porthole and steel to iron began slashing at the largest fluke chains but a few strokes full of sparks were given when the exceeding strain effected the rest with a terrific snap every fastening went adrift the ship righted the carcass sank now this occasional inevitable sinking of the recently killed sperm whale is a very curious thing nor has any fisherman yet adequately accounted for it usually the dead sperm whale floats with great buoyancy with its side or belly considerably elevated above the surface if the only whales that thus sank were old meagre and broken-hearted creatures their pads of lard diminished and all their bones heavy and rheumatic then you might with some reason assert that this sinking is caused by an uncommon specific gravity in the fish so sinking consequent upon this absence of buoyant matter in him but it is not so for young whales in the highest health and swelling with noble aspirations prematurely cut off in the warm flush and may of life with all their panting lard about them even these brawny buoyant heroes do sometimes sink be it said however that the sperm whale is far less liable to this accident than any other species where one of that sort go down twenty right whales do this difference in the species is no doubt imputable in no small degree to the greater quantity of bone in the right whale his venetian blinds alone sometimes weighing more than a ton from this encumbrance the sperm whale is wholly free but there are instances where after the lapse of many hours or several days the sunken whale again rises more buoyant than in life but the reasons of this are obvious gases are generated in him he swells to a prodigious magnitude becomes a sort of animal balloon a line of battleship could hardly keep him under then in the shore whaling on soundings among the bays of new zealand when a right whale gives token of sinking they fasten buoys to him with plenty of rope so that when the body has gone down they know where to look for it when it shall have ascended again it was not long after the sinking of the body that a cry was heard from the pequod's mastheads announcing that the jungfrau was again lowering her boats though the only spout in sight was that of a finback belonging to the species of uncapturable whales because of its incredible power of swimming nevertheless the finback spout is so similar to the sperm whales that by unskilful fishermen it is often mistaken for it and consequently derrick and all his host were now in valiant chase of this unnearable brute the virgin crowding all sail made after her four young keels and thus they all disappeared far to leeward still in bold hopeful chase oh many are the finbacks and many are the derricks my friend chapter eighty two the honour and glory of whaling there are some enterprises in which a careful disorderliness is the true method the more i dive into this matter of whaling and push my researches up to the very springhead of it so much the more am i impressed with its great honourableness and antiquity and especially when i find so many great demigods and heroes prophets of all sort who one way or other have shed distinction upon it i am transported with the reflection that i myself belong though but subordinately to so emblazoned a fraternity the gallant persis son of jupiter was the first whaleman and to the eternal honour of our calling be it said that the first whale attacked by our brotherhood was not killed with any sordid intent those were the knightly days of our profession when we only bore arms to succour the distressed not to fill men's lamp feeders every one knows the fine story of persis and andromeda how the lovely andromeda the daughter of a king was tied to a rock on the sea-coast and as leviathan was in the very act of carrying her off persis the prince of whalemen intrepidly advancing harpooned the monster and delivered and married the maid 
It was an admirable artistic exploit, rarely achieved by the best harpooners of the present day, inasmuch as this leviathan was slain at the very first dart. And let no man doubt this archite story, for in the ancient Joppa, now Jaffa, on the Syrian coast, in one of the pagan temples there stood for many ages the vast skeleton of a whale, which the city's legends and all the inhabitants asserted to be the identical bones of the monster that Persis slew. When the Romans took Joppa, the same skeleton was carried to Italy in triumph. What seems most singular and suggestively important in this story is this. It was from Joppa that Jonah set sail. Akin to the adventure of Persis and Andromeda, indeed by some supposed to be indirectly derived from it, is that famous story of St. George and the dragon, which dragon I maintain to have been a whale, for in many old chronicles whales and dragons are strangely jumbled together, and often stand for each other. Thou art as a lion of the waters, and as a dragon of the sea, saith Ezekiel, hereby plainly meaning a whale. In truth, some versions of the Bible use that word itself. Besides, it would much subtract from the glory of the exploit had St. George but encountered a crawling reptile of the land, instead of doing battle with the great monster of the deep. Any man may kill a snake, but only a Persis, a St. George, a coffin, have the heart in them to march boldly up to a whale. Let not the modern paintings of this scene mislead us, for though the creature encountered by that valiant whaleman of old is vaguely represented of a griffin-like shape, and though the battle is depicted on land and the saint on horseback, yet, considering the great ignorance of those times, when the true form of the whale was unknown to artists, and considering that, as in Persis's case, St. George's whale might have crawled up out of the sea on the beach, and considering that the animal ridden by St. George might have been only a large seal or seahorse, bearing all this in mind, it will not appear altogether incompatible with the sacred legend and the ancientest drafts of the scene to hold this so-called dragon no other than the great Leviathan himself. In fact, placed before the strict and piercing truth, this whole story will fare like that fish, flesh, and foul idol of the Philistines, Dagon by name, who, being planted before the Ark of Israel, his horse's head and both the palms of his hands fell off from him, and only the stump or fishy part of him remained. Thus, then, one of our own noble stamp, even a whaleman, is the tutelary guardian of England, and by good rights we harpooners of Nantucket should be enrolled in the most noble order of St. George. And therefore let not the knights of that honourable company, none of whom, I venture to say, have ever had to do with a whale like their great patron, let them never eye a Nantucketer with disdain, since even in our woollen frocks and tarred trousers we are much better entitled to St. George's decoration than they." Whether to admit Hercules among us or not, concerning this I long remained dubious. For though, according to the Greek mythologies, that antique Crockett and Kit Carson, that brawny doer of rejoicing good deeds, was swallowed down and thrown up by a whale, still whether that strictly makes a whaleman of him, that might be mooted. It nowhere appears that he ever actually harpooned his fish, unless indeed from the inside, Nevertheless, he may be deemed a sort of involuntary whaleman. At any rate, the whale caught him if he did not the whale. I claim him for one of our clan. But by the best contradictory authorities, this Grecian story of Hercules and the whale is considered to be derived from the still more ancient Hebrew story of Jonah and the whale, and vice versa. Certainly they are very similar. If I claim the demigod, then why not the prophet? Nor do heroes, saints, demigods, and prophets alone comprise the whole role of our order. Our grand master is still to be named, for like royal kings of old times, we find the headwaters of our fraternity in nothing short of the great gods themselves. That wondrous oriental story is now to be rehearsed from the Shaster, which gives us the dread Vishnu, 
one of the three persons of the godhead of the Hindus, gives us this divine Vishnu himself for our Lord. Vishnu, who, by the first of his ten earthly incarnations, has forever set apart and sanctified the whale. When Brahma, or the god of gods, saith the Shaster, resolved to recreate the world after one of its periodical dissolutions, he gave birth to Vishnu to preside over the work. But the Vedas, or mystical books, whose perusal would seem to have been indispensable to Vishnu before beginning the creation, and which therefore must have contained something in the shape of practical hints to young architects, these Vedas were lying at the bottom of the waters. So Vishnu became incarnate as a whale, and sounding down in him to the uttermost depths, rescued the sacred volumes. Was not this Vishnu a whaleman, then? Even as a man who rides a horse is called a horseman? Persis, St. George, Hercules, Jonah, and Vishnu. There's a member roll for you. What club but the whalemans can head off like that? Chapter 83 Jonah Historically Regarded Reference was made to the historical story of Jonah and the Whale in the preceding chapter. Now some Nantucketers rather distrust this historical story of Jonah and the Whale, but then there were some skeptical Greeks and Romans who, standing out from the orthodox pagans of their times, equally doubted the story of Hercules and the Whale, and Arion and the Dolphin and yet their doubting those traditions did not make those traditions one whit the less facts for all that. One old Sag Harbor whaleman's chief reason for questioning the Hebrew story was this. He had one of those quaint, old-fashioned Bibles, embellished with curious, unscientific plates, one of which represented Jonah's whale with two spouts in his head a peculiarity only true with respect to a species of the leviathan, the right whale, and varieties of that order, concerning which the fishermen have this saying, a penny roll would choke him, his swallow is so very small, but to this Bishop Jeb's anticipative answer is ready. It is not necessary, hints the bishop, that we consider Jonah as tombed in the whale's belly, but as temporarily lodged in some part of his mouth, and this seems reasonable enough in the good bishop, for truly the right whale's mouth would accommodate a couple of whist tables, and comfortably seat all the players. Possibly, too, Jonah might have ensconced himself in a hollow tooth, but on second thoughts the right whale is toothless. Another reason which Sag Harbor, he went by that name, urged for his want of faith in this matter of the prophet, was something obscurely in reference to his incarcerated body and the whale's gastric juices. But this objection likewise falls to the ground, because a German exegetist supposes that Jonah must have taken refuge in the floating body of a dead whale, even as the French soldiers in the Russian campaign turned their dead horses into tents and crawled into them. Besides, it has been divined by other continental commentators that when Jonah was thrown overboard from the Joppa ship, he straightway effected his escape to another vessel nearby, some vessel with a whale for a figurehead, and, I would add, possibly called the whale, as some craft nowadays are christened the shark, the gull, the eagle. Nor have there been wanting learned exegetists who have opined that the whale mentioned in the book of Jonah merely meant a life-preserver, an inflated bag of wind, which the endangered prophet swam to, and so was saved from a watery doom. Poor Sag Harbor, therefore, seems worsted all round. But he had still another reason for his want of faith. It was this, if I remember right, Jonah was swallowed by the whale in the Mediterranean Sea, and after three days he was vomited up somewhere within three days' journey of Nineveh, a city on the Tigris, very much more than three days' journey across from the nearest point of the Mediterranean coast. How is that? But was there no other way for the whale to land the prophet within that short distance of Nineveh? Yes, he might have carried him round by the way of the Cape of Good Hope but not to speak of the passage through the whole length of the Mediterranean, 
and another passage up the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea, such a supposition would involve the complete circumnavigation of all Africa in three days, not to speak of the Tigris waters near the site of Nineveh, being too shallow for any whale to swim in. Besides, this idea of Jonah's weathering the Cape of Good Hope at so early a day would wrest the honour of the discovery of that great headland from Bartholomew Diaz, its reputed discoverer, and so make modern history a liar. But all these foolish arguments of old Sag Harbour only evinced his foolish pride of reason, a thing still more reprehensible in him, seeing that he had but little learning except what he had picked up from the sun and the sea. I say it only shows his foolish, impious pride, and abominable, devilish rebellion against the reverend clergy. For by a Portuguese Catholic priest, this very idea of Jonah's going to Nineveh, via the Cape of Good Hope, was advanced as a signal magnification of the general miracle, and so it was. Besides, to this day, the highly enlightened Turks devoutly believe in the historical story of Jonah. And some three centuries ago, an English traveller, in old Harris's voyages, speaks of a Turkish mosque built in honour of Jonah, in which mosque was a miraculous lamp that burnt without any oil. Chapter 84 Pitch-Polling To make them run easily and swiftly, the axles of carriages are anointed, and for much the same purpose some whalers perform an analogous operation upon their boat. They grease the bottom. Nor is it to be doubted that as such a procedure can do no harm, it may possibly be of no contemptible advantage, considering that oil and water are hostile, that oil is a sliding thing, and that the object in view is to make the boat slide bravely. Queequeg believes strongly in anointing his boat, and one morning, not long after the German ship Jungfrau disappeared, took more than customary pains in that occupation, crawling under its bottom where he hung over the side, and rubbing in the unctuousness as though diligently seeking to ensure a crop of hair from the craft's bald keel. He seemed to be working in obedience to some particular presentiment, nor did it remain unwarranted by the event. Towards noon, whales were raised, but so soon as the ship sailed down to them, they turned and fled with swift precipitancy, a disordered flight as of Cleopatra's barges from Actium. Nevertheless, the boats pursued, and Stubbs was foremost. By great exertion, Tashtego at last succeeded in planting one iron, but the stricken whale, without at all sounding, still continued his horizontal flight, with added fleetness. Such unintermitted strainings upon the planted iron must sooner or later inevitably extract it. It became imperative to lance the flying whale, or be content to lose him. But to haul the boat up to his flank was impossible, he swam so fast and furious. What then remained? Of all the wondrous devices and dexterities, the slights of hand and countless subtleties to which the veteran whaleman is so often forced, none exceed that fine manoeuvre with the lance called pitch-poling. Small sword or broadsword, in all its exercises, boasts nothing like it. It is only indispensable with an inveterate running whale. Its grand fact and feature is the wonderful distance to which the long lance is accurately darted from a violently rocking, jerking boat, under extreme headway. Steel and wood included, the entire spear is some ten or twelve feet in length, the staff is much slighter than that of the harpoon, and also of lighter material, pine. It is furnished with a small rope called a warp, of considerable length, by which it can be hauled back to the hand after darting. But before going further, it is important to mention here, that though the harpoon may be pitch-poled in the same way with the lance, yet it is seldom done, and when done it is still less frequently successful, on account of the greater weight and inferior length of the harpoon as compared with the lance, which in effect become serious drawbacks. As a general thing, therefore, 
you must first get fast to a whale before any pitch poling comes into play. Look now at Stubb, a man who, from his humorous, deliberate coolness and equanimity in the direst emergencies, was specially qualified to excel in pitch poling. Look at him. He stands upright in the tossed bow of the flying boat, wrapped in fleecy foam. The towing whale is forty feet ahead. Handling the long lance, lightly, glancing twice or thrice along its length to see if it be exactly straight, Stubb whistlingly gathers up the coil of the warp in one hand, so as to secure its free end in his grasp, leaving the rest unobstructed. Then, holding the lance full before his waistband's middle, he levels it at the whale, when, covering him with it, he steadily depresses the butt-end in his hand, thereby elevating the point till the weapon stands fairly balanced upon his palm, fifteen feet in the air. He minds you somewhat of a juggler, balancing a long staff on his chin. Next moment, with a rapid, nameless impulse, in a superb, lofty arch, the bright steel spans the foaming distance and quivers in the life-spot of the whale. Instead of sparkling water, he now spouts red blood. "'That drove the spigot out of him,' cried Stubb. "'Tis July's immortal fourth. All fountains must run wine to-day. Would now it were old New Orleans whiskey or old Ohio, or unspeakable old Monongahela. Then, Tashtego, lad, I'd have ye hold a canakin to the jet, and we'd drink round of it. Yea, verily, heart's alive. We'd brew choice punch in the spread of his spout-hole there.' from that live punch-bowl quaff the living stuff. Again and again, to such gamesome talk, the dexterous dart is repeated, the spear returning to its master like a greyhound held in skilful leash. The agonized whale goes into his flurry, the tow-line is slackened, and the pitch-poler, dropping astern, folds his hands and mutely watches the monster die. Chapter 85 the Fountain That for six thousand years, and no one knows how many millions of ages before, the great whale should have been spouting all over the sea, and sprinkling and mystifying the gardens of the deep, as with so many sprinkling or mystifying pots, and that for some centuries back thousands of hunters should have been close by the fountain of the whale, watching these sprinklings and spoutings, that all this should be, and yet that down to this blessed minute, fifteen and a quarter minutes past one o'clock p.m. of this sixteenth day of December, A.D. 1851, it should still remain a problem whether these spoutings are, after all, really water, or nothing but vapor, this is surely a noteworthy thing. Let us then look at this matter, along with some interesting items contingent. Everyone knows that by the peculiar cunning of their gills, the finny tribes in general breathe the air which at all times is combined with the element in which they swim. Hence a herring or cod might live a century, and never once raise its head above the surface. But owing to his marked internal structure which gives him regular lungs, like a human being's, the whale can only live by inhaling the disengaged air in the open atmosphere wherefore the necessity for his periodical visits to the upper world. But he cannot in any degree breathe through his mouth, for in his ordinary attitude the sperm-whale's mouth is buried at least eight feet beneath the surface, and, what is still more, his windpipe has no connection with his mouth. No, he breathes through his spiracle alone, and this is on the top of his head." If I say that in any creature, breathing is only a function indispensable to vitality, inasmuch as it withdraws from the air a certain element, which, being subsequently brought into contact with the blood, imparts to the blood its vivifying principle, I do not think I shall err, though I may possibly use some superfluous scientific words. Assume it, and it follows that if all the blood in a man could be aerated in one breath, he might then seal up his nostrils and not fetch another for a considerable time. That is to say, he would then live without breathing. Anomalous as it may seem, this is precisely the case with the whale, 
who systematically lives by intervals his full hour and more, when at the bottom, without drawing a single breath, or so much as in any way inhaling a particle of air, for, remember, he has no gills. How is this? Between his ribs and on each side of his spine, he is supplied with a remarkable, involved, cretin labyrinth of vermicelli-like vessels, which vessels, when he quits the surface, are completely distended with oxygenated blood, so that, for an hour or more, a thousand fathoms in the sea, he carries a surplus stock of vitality in him, just as the camel, crossing the waterless desert, carries a surplus supply of drink for future use in its four supplementary stomachs, the anatomical fact of this labyrinth is indisputable, and that the supposition founded upon it is reasonable and true seems the more cogent to me when I consider the otherwise inexplicable obstinacy of that leviathan in having his spoutings out, as the fishermen phrase it. This is what I mean. If unmolested, upon rising to the surface, the sperm whale will continue there for a period of time exactly uniform with all his other unmolested risings. Say he stays eleven minutes and jets seventy times, that is, respires seventy breaths, then whenever he rises again, he will be sure to have his seventy breaths all over again, to a minute. Now if, after he fetches a few breaths, you alarm him, so that he sounds, he will be always dodging up again to make good his regular allowance of air and not till those seventy breaths are told will he finally go down to stay out his full term below. Remark, however, that in different individuals these rates are different, but in any one they are alike. Now why should the whale thus insist upon having his spoutings out, unless it be to replenish his reservoir of air ere descending for good? How obvious is it, too, that this necessity for the whale's rising exposes him to all the fatal hazards of the chase. For not by hook or by net could this vast leviathan be caught when sailing a thousand fathoms beneath the sunlight. Not so much thy skill, then, O hunter, as the great necessities that strike the victory to thee. In man breathing is incessantly going on, one breath only serving for two or three pulsations, so that whatever other business he has to attend to, waking or sleeping, breathe he must, or die he will. But the sperm whale only breathes about one-seventh or Sunday of his time. It has been said that the whale only breathes through his spout-hole. If it could truthfully be added that his spouts are mixed with water, then I opine we should be furnished with the reason why his sense of smell seems obliterated in him, for the only thing about him that at all answers to his nose is that identical spout-hole, and being so clogged with two elements, it could not be expected to have the power of smelling. But owing to the mystery of the spout, whether it be water or whether it be vapour, no absolute certainty can as yet be arrived at on this head. Sure it is, nevertheless, that the sperm-whale has no proper olfactories. But what does he want of them? no roses, no violets, no cologne water in the sea. Furthermore, as his windpipe solely opens into the tube of his spouting canal, and as that long canal, like the Grand Erie Canal, is furnished with a sort of locks that open and shut for the downward retention of air or the upward exclusion of water, therefore the whale has no voice, unless you insult him by saying that when he so strangely rumbles, he talks through his nose. But then again, what has the whale to say? Seldom have I known any profound being that had anything to say to this world, unless forced to stammer out something by way of getting a living. Oh, happy that the world is such an excellent listener! Now the spouting canal of the sperm whale, chiefly intended as it is for the conveyance of air, and for several feet laid along horizontally just beneath the upper surface of his head, and a little to one side, this curious canal is very much like a gas-pipe laid down in a city on one side of a street. But the question returns whether this gas-pipe is also a water-pipe, in other words, whether the spout of the sperm whale is the mere vapour of the exhaled breath, or whether that exhaled breath is mixed with water taken in at the mouth, 
and discharged through the spiracle. It is certain that the mouth indirectly communicates with the spouting canal, but it cannot be proved that this is for the purpose of discharging water through the spiracle, because the greatest necessity for so doing would seem to be when in feeding he accidentally takes in water. But the sperm whale's food is far beneath the surface, and there he cannot spout even if he would. Besides, if you regard him very closely, and time him with your watch, you will find that when unmolested, there is an undeviating rhyme between the periods of his jets and the ordinary periods of respiration. But why pester one with all this reasoning on the subject? Speak out! You have seen him spout. Then declare what the spout is. Can you not tell water from air? My dear sir, in this world it is not so easy to settle these plain things. I have ever found your plain things the naughtiest of all, and as for this whale-spout, you might almost stand in it and yet be undecided as to what it is precisely. The central body of it is hidden in the snowy, sparkling mist enveloping it, and how can you certainly tell whether any water falls from it, when always, when you are close enough to a whale to get a close view of his spout, he is in a prodigious commotion, the water cascading all around him, and if at such times you should think that you really perceive drops of moisture in the spout, how do you know that they are not merely condensed from its vapor? Or how do you know that they are not those identical drops superficially lodged in the spout-hole fissure, which is countersunk into the summit of the whale's head? For even when tranquilly swimming through the midday sea in a calm, with his elevated hump sun-dried as a dromedary's in the desert, even then the whale always carries a small basin of water on his head, as under a blazing sun you will sometimes see a cavity in a rock filled up with rain. Nor is it at all prudent for the hunter to be over-curious touching the precise nature of the whale-spout. It will not do for him to be peering into it and putting his face in it. You cannot go with your pitcher to this fountain and fill it and bring it away. For even when coming into slight contact with the outer vapory shreds of the jet, which will often happen, your skin will feverishly smart from the acridness of the thing so touching it. And I know one who, coming into still closer contact with the spout, whether with some scientific object in view or otherwise, I cannot say, the skin peeled off from his cheek and arm. Wherefore, among whalemen, the spout is deemed poisonous. They try to evade it. Another thing, I have heard it said, and I do not much doubt it, that if the jet is fairly spouted into your eyes, it will blind you. The wisest thing the investigator can do, then, it seems to me, is to let this deadly spout alone. Still, we can hypothesize, even if we cannot prove and establish. My hypothesis is this, that the spout is nothing but mist. And besides other reasons, to this conclusion I am impelled by considerations touching the great inherent dignity and sublimity of the sperm whale. I account him no common, shallow being, inasmuch as it is an undisputed fact that he is never found on soundings or near shores, all other whales sometimes are. He is both ponderous and profound, and I am convinced that from the heads of all ponderous, profound beings, such as Plato, Pyrrho, the Devil, Jupiter, Dante, and so on, there always goes up a certain semi-visible steam while in the act of thinking deep thoughts. While composing a little treatise on eternity, I had the curiosity to place a mirror before me, and ere long saw reflected there a curious, involved worming and undulation in the atmosphere over my head, the invariable moisture of my hair, while plunged in deep thought, after six cups of hot tea in my thin shingled attic of an August noon, this seems an additional argument for the above supposition. And how nobly it raises our conceit of the mighty, misty monster, to behold him solemnly sailing through a calm tropical sea, his vast, mild head overhung by a canopy of vapor, engendered by his incommunicable contemplations, and that vapor, as you will sometimes see it, glorified by a rainbow, as if heaven itself had put its seal upon his thoughts. 
for do you see rainbows do not visit the clear air they only irradiate vapour and so through all the thick mists of the dim doubts in my mind divine intuitions now and then shoot enkindling my fog with a heavenly ray and for this i thank god for all have doubts many deny but doubts or denials few along with them have intuitions doubts of all things earthly and intuitions of some things heavenly this combination makes neither believer nor infidel but makes a man who regards them both with equal eye chapter eighty six the tale other poets have warbled the praises of the soft eye of the antelope and the lovely plumage of the bird that never alights less celestial i celebrate a tale reckoning the largest sized sperm whale's tail to begin at that point of the trunk where it tapers to about the girth of a man it comprises upon its upper surface alone an area of at least fifty square feet the compact round body of its root expands into two broad firm flat palms or flukes gradually shoaling away to less than an inch in thickness at the crotch or junction these flukes slightly overlap then sideways recede from each other like wings leaving a wide vacancy between in no living thing are the lines of beauty more exquisitely defined than in the crescentic borders of these flukes at its utmost expansion in the full-grown whale the tail will considerably exceed twenty feet across the entire member seems a dense webbed bed of welded sinews but cut into it and you find that three distinct strata compose it upper middle and lower the fibres in the upper and lower layers are long and horizontal those of the middle one very short and running crosswise between the outside layers this triune structure as much as anything else imparts power to the tail to the student of old roman walls the middle layer will furnish a curious parallel to the thin course of tiles always alternating with the stone in those wonderful relics of the antique and which undoubtedly contribute so much to the great strength of the masonry but as if this vast local power in the tendinous tail were not enough the whole bulk of the leviathan is knit over with a warp and woof of muscular fibres and filaments which passing on either side the loins and running down into the flukes insensibly blend with them and largely contribute to their might so that in the tail the confluent measureless force of the whole whale seems concentrated to a point could annihilation occur to matter this were the thing to do it nor does this its amazing strength at all tend to cripple the graceful flexion of its motions where infantileness of ease undulates through a titanism of power on the contrary those motions derive their most appalling beauty from it real strength never impairs beauty or harmony but it often bestows it and in everything imposingly beautiful strength has much to do with the magic take away the tied tendons that all over seem bursting from the marble in carved hercules and its charm would be gone as the devout eckerman lifted the linen sheet from the naked corpse of goethe he was overwhelmed with the massive chest of the man that seemed as a roman triumphal arch when angelo paints even god the father in human form mark what robustness is there and whatever they may reveal of the divine love in the sun the soft curled hermaphroditical italian pictures in which his idea has been most successfully embodied these pictures so destitute as they are of all brawniness hint nothing of any power but the mere negative feminine one of submission and endurance which on all hands it is conceded form the peculiar practical virtues of his teachings such is the subtle elasticity of the organ i treat of that whether wielded in sport or in earnest or in anger whatever be the mood it be in its flexions are invariably marked by exceeding grace therein no fairy's arm can transcend it 
five great motions are peculiar to it. First, when used as a fin for progression. Second, when used as a mace in battle. Third, in sweeping. Fourth, in lobtailing. Fifth, in peaking flukes. First, being horizontal in its position, the leviathan's tail acts in a different manner from the tails of all other sea creatures. It never wriggles. In man or fish, wriggling is a sign of inferiority. To the whale, his tail is the sole means of propulsion, scroll-wise coiled forwards beneath the body, and then rapidly sprung backwards, it is this which gives that singular darting, leaping motion to the monster when furiously swimming. His side fins only serve to steer by. Second, it is a little significant that while one sperm whale only fights another sperm whale with his head and jaw, nevertheless in his conflicts with man he chiefly and contemptuously uses his tail. In striking at a boat he swiftly curves away his flukes from it, and the blow is only inflicted by the recoil. If it be made in the unobstructed air, especially if it descend to its mark, the stroke is then simply irresistible. No ribs of man or boat can withstand it. Your only salvation lies in eluding it, but if it comes sideways through the opposing water, then partly owing to the light buoyancy of the whale-boat, and the elasticity of its materials, a cracked rib or a dashed plank or two, a sort of stitch in the side, is generally the most serious result. These submerged side-blows are so often received in the fishery that they are accounted mere child's play. Someone strips off a frock, and the hole is stopped. Third, I cannot demonstrate it, but it seems to me that in the whale the sense of touch is concentrated in the tail, for in this respect there is a delicacy in it only equalled by the daintiness of the elephant's trunk. This delicacy is chiefly evinced in the action of sweeping, when in maidenly gentleness the whale with a certain soft slowness moves his immense flukes from side to side upon the surface of the sea and if he feels but a sailor's whisker, woe to that sailor, whiskers and all, what tenderness there is in that preliminary touch. Had this tail any prehensile power, I should straightway bethink me of Darmonides' elephant that so frequented the flower-market, and with low salutations presented nosegays to damsels, and then caressed their zones. On more accounts than one, a pity it is that the whale does not possess this prehensile virtue in his tail. For I have heard of yet another elephant that, when wounded in the fight, curved round his trunk and extracted the dart. Fourth, stealing unawares upon the whale in the fancied security of the middle of solitary seas, you find him unbent from the vast corpulence of his dignity, and kitten-like he plays on the ocean as if it were a hearth. But still you see his power in his play. The broad palms of his tail are flirted high into the air, then smiting the surface the thunderous concussion resounds for miles. You would almost think a great gun had been discharged, and if you notice the light wreath of vapour from the spiracle at his other extremity, you would think that that was the smoke from the touch-hole. Fifth, as in the ordinary floating posture of the leviathan, the flukes lie considerably below the level of his back, they are then completely out of sight beneath the surface, but when he is about to plunge into the deeps, his entire flukes with at least thirty feet of his body are tossed erect in the air, and so remain vibrating a moment, till they downward shoot out of view. Excepting the sublime breach, somewhere else to be described, this peaking of the whale's flukes is perhaps the grandest sight to be seen in all animated nature. Out of the bottomless profundities the gigantic tail seems spasmodically snatching at the highest heaven. So in dreams have I seen majestic Satan thrusting forth his tormented colossal claw from the flame Baltic of hell. But in gazing at such scenes, it is all in all what mood you are in. If in the Dantean, the devils will occur to you. If in that of Isaiah, the archangels. Standing at the masthead of my ship during a sunrise that crimsons sky and sea, 
I once saw a large herd of whales in the east, all heading towards the sun, and for a moment vibrating in concert with peaked flukes. As it seemed to me at the time, such a grand embodiment of adoration of the gods was never beheld, even in Persia, the home of the fire-worshippers. As Ptolemy Philopater testified of the African elephant, I then testified of the whale, pronouncing him the most devout of all beings. For, according to King Juba, the military elephants of antiquity often hailed the morning with their trunks uplifted in the profoundest silence. The chance comparison in this chapter between the whale and the elephant, so far as some aspects of the tail of the one and the trunk of the other are concerned, should not tend to place those two opposite organs on an equality, much less the creatures to which they respectively belong. For as the mightiest elephant is but a terrier to Leviathan, so, compared with Leviathan's tail, his trunk is but the stalk of a lily. The most direful blow from the elephant's trunk were as the playful tap of a fan, compared with the measureless crush and crash of the sperm whale's ponderous flukes, which in repeated instances have one after the other hurled entire boats with all their oars and crews into the air, very much as an Indian juggler tosses his balls. Footnote. Though all comparison in the way of general bulk between the whale and the elephant is preposterous, inasmuch as in that particular the elephant stands in much the same respect to the whale as a dog does to the elephant, nevertheless there are not wanting some points of curious similitude. Among these is the spout. It is well known that the elephant will often draw up water or dust in his trunk, and then, elevating it, jet it forth in a stream. End of footnote. The more I consider this mighty tale, the more do I deplore my inability to express it. At times there are gestures in it which, though they would well grace the hand of man, remain wholly inexplicable. In an extensive herd so remarkable occasionally are these mystic gestures that I have heard hunters who have declared them akin to Freemason signs and symbols, that the whale indeed by these methods intelligently conversed with the world nor are there wanting other motions of the whale in his general body, full of strangeness and unaccountable to his most experienced assailant. Dissect him how I may, then, I go but skin deep. I know him not, and never will. But if I know not even the tail of this whale, how understand his head? Much more how comprehend his face, when face he has none. Thou shalt see my back parts, my tail, he seems to say, but my face shall not be seen. But I cannot completely make out his back parts, and hint what he will about his face. I say again, he has no face. Chapter 87 The Grand Armada The long and narrow peninsula of Malacca, extending southeastward from the territories of Burma, forms the most southerly point of all Asia. In a continuous line from that peninsula stretch the long islands of Sumatra, Java, Bali, and Timor, which, with many others, form a vast mole or rampart lengthwise connecting Asia with Australia, and dividing the long unbroken Indian Ocean from the thickly studded Oriental archipelagos. This rampart is pierced by several sally-ports for the convenience of ships and whales, conspicuous among which are the Straits of Sunda and Malacca. By the Straits of Sunda, chiefly, vessels bound to China from the west emerge into the China Seas. Those narrow Straits of Sunda divide Sumatra from Java, and standing midway in that vast rampart of islands, buttressed by that bold green promontory known to seamen as Java Head, they not a little correspond to the central gateway opening into some vast walled empire, and considering the inexhaustible wealth of spices and silks and jewels and gold and ivory with which the thousand islands of that oriental sea are enriched, it seems a significant provision of nature that such treasures by the very formation of the land should at least bear the appearance, however ineffectual, 
of being guarded from the all-grasping western world the shores of the straits of sunda are unsupplied with those domineering fortresses which guard the entrances to the mediterranean the baltic and the propontis unlike the danes these orientals do not demand the obsequious homage of lowered topsails from the endless procession of ships before the wind which for centuries past by night and day have passed between the islands of sumatra and java freighted with the costliest cargoes of the east but while they freely waive a ceremonial like this they do by no means renounce their claim to more solid tribute time out of mind the piratical proas of the malays lurking among the low shaded coves and islets of sumatra have sallied out upon the vessels sailing through the straits fiercely demanding tribute at the point of their spears though by the repeated bloody chastisements they have received at the hands of european cruisers the audacity of these corsairs has of late been somewhat repressed yet even at the present day we occasionally hear of english and american vessels which in those waters have been remorselessly boarded and pillaged with a fair fresh wind the pequod was now drawing nigh to these straits ahab purposing to pass through them into the javan seas and thence cruising northward over waters known to be frequented here and there by the sperm whale sweep inshore by the philippine islands and gain the far coast of japan in time for the great whaling season there by these means the circumnavigating pequod would sweep almost all the known sperm whale cruising grounds of the world previous to descending upon the line in the pacific where ahab though everywhere else foiled in his pursuit firmly counted upon giving battle to moby dick in the sea he was most known to frequent and at a season when he might most reasonably be presumed to be haunting it but how now in this zoned quest does ahab touch no land does his crew drink air surely he will stop for water nay for a long time now the circus-running sun has raced within his fiery ring and needs no sustenance but what's in himself so ahab mark this too in the whaler while other hulls are loaded down with alien stuff to be transferred to foreign wharves the world-wandering whale-ship carries no cargo but herself and crew their weapons and their wants she has a whole lake's contents bottled in her ample hold she is ballasted with utilities not altogether with unusable pig-lead and kentledge she carries years water in her clear old prime nantucket water which when three years afloat the nantucketer in the pacific prefers to drink before the brackish fluid but yesterday rafted off in casks from the peruvian or indian streams hence it is that while other ships may have gone to china from new york and back again touching at a score of ports the whale-ship in all that interval may not have sighted one grain of soil her crew having seen no man but floating seamen like themselves so that did you carry them the news that another flood had come they would only answer well boys here's the ark now as many sperm whales had been captured off the western coast of java in the near vicinity of the straits of sunda indeed as most of the ground round about was generally recognized by fishermen as an excellent spot for cruising therefore as the pequod gained more and more upon java head the lookouts were repeatedly hailed and admonished to keep wide awake but though the green palmy cliffs of the land soon loomed on the starboard bow and with delighted nostrils the fresh cinnamon was snuffed in the air yet not a single jet was descried almost renouncing all thoughts of falling in with any game hereabouts the ship had well nigh entered the straits when the customary cheering cry was heard from aloft and ere long a spectacle of singular magnificence saluted us but here be it premise that owing to the unwearied activity with which of late they have been hunted over all four oceans the sperm whales instead of almost invariably sailing in small detached companies as in former times are now frequently met with in extensive herds sometimes embracing so great a multitude that it would almost seem as if numerous nations of them had sworn solemn league and covenant for mutual assistance and protection 
to this aggregation of the sperm whale into such immense caravans may be imputed the circumstance that even in the best cruising grounds you may now sometimes sail for weeks and months together without being greeted by a single spout and then suddenly be saluted by what sometimes seems thousands on thousands broad on both bows at a distance of some two or three miles and forming a great semicircle embracing one half of the level horizon a continuous chain of whale jets were up playing and sparkling in the noonday air unlike the straight perpendicular twin jets of the right whale which dividing at top fall over in two branches like the cleft drooping boughs of a willow the single forward slanting spout of the sperm whale presents a thick curled bush of white mist continually rising and falling away to leeward seen from the pequod's deck then as she would rise on a high hill of the sea this host of vapory spouts individually curling up into the air and beheld through a blending atmosphere of bluish haze showed like the thousand cheerful chimneys of some dense metropolis descried of a balmy autumnal morning by some horseman on a height as marching armies approaching an unfriendly defile in the mountains accelerate their march all eagerness to place that perilous passage in their rear and once more expand in comparative security upon the plain even so did this vast fleet of whales now seem hurrying forward through the straits gradually contracting the wings of their semicircle and swimming on in one solid but still crescentic centre crowding all sail the pequod pressed after them the harpooners handling their weapons and loudly cheering from the heads of their yet suspended boats if the wind only held little doubt had they that chased through these straits of sunda the vast host would only deploy into the oriental seas to witness the capture of not a few of their number and who could tell whether in that congregated caravan moby dick himself might not temporarily be swimming like the worshipped white elephant in the coronation procession of the siamese so with stunsail piled on stunsail we sailed along driving these leviathans before us when of a sudden the voice of tashtego was heard loudly directing attention to something in our wake corresponding to the crescent in our van we beheld another in our rear it seemed formed of detached white vapors rising and falling something like the spouts of the whales only they did not so completely come and go for they constantly hovered without finally disappearing levelling his glass at this sight ahab quickly revolved in his pivot hole crying aloft there and rig whips and buckets to wet the sails malays sir and after us as if too long lurking behind the headlands till the pequod should fairly have entered the straits these rascally asiatics were now in hot pursuit to make up for their overcautious delay but when the swift pequod with a fresh leading wind was herself in hot chase how very kind of these tawny philanthropists to assist in speeding her on to her own chosen pursuit mere riding whips and rolls to her as they were as with glass under arm ahab to and fro paced on the deck in his forward turn beholding the monsters he chased and in the after one the bloodthirsty pirates chasing him some such fancy as the above seemed his and when he glanced upon the green walls of the watery defile in which the ship was then sailing and bethought him that through that gate lay the route to his vengeance and beheld how through that same gate he was now both chasing and being chased to his deadly end and not only that but a herd of remorseless wild pirates and inhuman atheistical devils were infernally cheering him on with their curses when all these conceits had passed through his brain ahab's brow was left gaunt and ribbed like the black sand beach after some stormy tide has been gnawing it without being able to drag the firm thing from its place but thoughts like these troubled very few of the reckless crew and when after steadily dropping and dropping the pirates astern the pequod at last shot by the vivid green cockatoo point on the sumatra side emerging at last upon the broad waters beyond then the harpooners seemed more to grieve that the swift whales had been gaining upon the ship 
than to rejoice that the ship had so victoriously gained upon the Malays. But still driving on in the wake of the whales, at length they seemed abating their speed. Gradually the ship neared them, and the wind now dying away, word was passed to spring to the boats. But no sooner did the herd, by some presumed wonderful instinct of the sperm whale, become notified of the three keels that were after them, though as yet a mile in their rear, then they rallied again, and forming in close ranks and battalions, so that their spouts all looked like flashing lines of stacked bayonets, moved on with redoubled velocity. Stripped to our shirts and drawers, we sprang to the white ash, and after several hours pulling were almost disposed to renounce the chase, when a general pausing commotion among the whales gave animating token that they were now at last under the influence of that strange perplexity of inert irresolution, which, when fishermen perceive it in the whale, they say he is gallied. The compact martial columns in which they had been hitherto rapidly and steadily swimming were now broken up in one measureless rout, and like King Porus's elephant in the Indian battle with Alexander, they seemed going mad with consternation. In all directions expanding in vast irregular circles, and aimlessly swimming hither and thither by their short thick spoutings, they plainly betrayed their distraction of panic. This was still more strangely evinced by those of their number who, completely paralyzed as it were, helplessly floated like waterlogged dismantled ships on the sea had these leviathans been but a flock of simple sheep pursued over the pasture by three fierce wolves they could not possibly have evinced such excessive dismay but this occasional timidity is characteristic of almost all herding creatures though banding together in tens of thousands the lion-maned buffaloes of the west have fled before a solitary horseman Witness, too, all human beings, how, when herded together in the sheepfold of a theatre's pit, they will, at the slightest alarm of fire, rush helter-skelter for the outlets, crowding, trampling, jamming, and remorselessly dashing each other to death. Best, therefore, withhold any amazement at the strangely gallied whales before us, for there is no folly of the beasts of the earth which is not infinitely outdone by the madness of men. Though many of the whales, as has been said, were in violent motion, yet it is to be observed that as a whole the herd neither advanced nor retreated, but collectively remained in one place. As is customary in those cases, the boats at once separated, each making for some one lone whale on the outskirts of the shoal. In about three minutes' time Queequeg's harpoon was flung. The stricken fish darted blinding spray in our faces, and then running away with us like light steered straight for the heart of the herd though such a movement on the part of the whale struck under such circumstances is in no wise unprecedented and indeed is almost always more or less anticipated yet does it present one of the more perilous vicissitudes of the fishery for as the swift monster drags you deeper and deeper into the frantic shoal you bid adieu to circumspect life and only exist in a delirious throb as blind and deaf the whale plunged forward as if by sheer power of speed to rid himself of the iron leech that had fastened to him as we thus tore a white gash in the sea on all sides menaced as we flew by the crazed creatures to and fro rushing about us our beset boat was like a ship mobbed by ice isles in a tempest and striving to steer through their complicated channels and straits not knowing at what moment it may be locked in and crushed. But not a bit daunted, Queequeg steered us manfully, now shearing off from this monster directly across our route in advance, now edging away from that, whose colossal flukes were suspended overhead, while all the time Starbuck stood up in the bows, lance in hand, pricking out of our way whatever whales he could reach by short darts, for there was no time to make long ones nor were the oarsmen quite idle, though their wanted duty was now altogether dispensed with. They chiefly attended to the shouting part of the business. "'Out of the way, Commodore!' cried one, to a great dromedary that of a sudden rose bodily to the surface, and for an instant threatened to swamp us. "'Hard down with your tail there!' cried a second to another, 
which, close to our gunwale, seemed calmly cooling himself with his own fan-like extremity. All whale-boats carry certain curious contrivances, originally invented by the Nantucket Indians, called drugs. Two thick squares of wood, of equal size, are stoutly clenched together, so that they cross each other's grain at right angles. A line of considerable length is then attached to the middle of this block, and the other end of the line being looped, it can in a moment be fastened to a harpoon. It is chiefly among gallied whales that this drug is used, for then more whales are close round you than you can possibly chase at one time. But sperm whales are not every day encountered, while you may then, you must kill all you can. And if you cannot kill them all at once, you must wing them, so that they can be afterwards killed at your leisure. Hence it is that at times like these the drug comes into requisition. Our boat was furnished with three of them. The first and second were successfully darted, and we saw the whales staggeringly running off, fettered by the enormous sidelong resistance of the towing drug. They were cramped like malefactors with the chain and ball. But upon flinging the third, in the act of tossing overboard the clumsy wooden block, it caught under one of the seats of the boat, and in an instant tore it out and carried it away, dropping the oarsman in the boat's bottom as the seat slid from under him. On both sides the sea came in at the wounded planks, but we stuffed two or three drawers and shirts in, and so stopped the leaks for the time. It had been next to impossible to dart these drugged harpoons, were it not that as we advanced into the herd our whale's way greatly diminished, moreover that as we went still further and further from the circumference of commotion the direful disorders seemed waning, so that when at last the jerking harpoon drew out and the towing whale sideways vanished, then, with the tapering force of his parting momentum, we glided between two whales into the innermost heart of the shoal, as if from some mountain torrent we had slid into a serene valley lake. Here the storms and the roaring glens between the outermost whales were heard, but not felt. In this central expanse the sea presented that smooth, satin-like surface called a sleek, produced by the subtle moisture thrown off by the whale in his more quiet moods. Yes, we were now in that enchanted calm which they say lurks at the heart of every commotion, and still in the distracted distance we beheld the tumults of the outer concentric circles, and saw successive pods of whales, eight or ten in each, swiftly going round and round, like multiplied spans of horses in a ring, and so closely, shoulder to shoulder, that a titanic circus rider might easily have overarched the middle ones, and so have gone round on their backs. Owing to the density of the crowd of reposing whales, more immediately surrounding the embayed axis of the herd, no possible chance of escape was at present afforded us. We must watch for a breach in the living wall that hemmed us in, the wall that had only admitted us in order to shut us up. Keeping at the centre of the lake, we were occasionally visited by small, tame cows and calves, the women and children of this routed host. Now, inclusive of the occasional wide intervals between the revolving outer circles, and inclusive of the spaces between the various pods in any one of those circles, the entire area at this juncture, embraced by the whole multitude, must have contained at least two or three square miles, at any rate, though indeed such a test at such a time might be deceptive, spoutings might be discovered from our low boat that seemed playing up almost from the rim of the horizon. I mention this circumstance because, as if the cows and calves had been purposely locked up in this innermost fold, and as if the wide extent of the herd had hitherto prevented them from learning the precise cause of its stopping, or possibly being so young, unsophisticated, and every way innocent and inexperienced, however it may have been, these smaller whales, now and then visiting our becalmed boat from the margin of the lake, evinced a wondrous fearlessness and confidence, or else a still becharmed panic which it was impossible not to marvel at. Like household dogs they came snuffling round us, right up to our gunwales, and touching them, till it almost seemed that some spell had suddenly domesticated them. 
Queequeg patted their foreheads, Starbuck scratched their backs with his lance, but fearful of the consequences, for the time refrained from darting it. But far beneath this wondrous world upon the surface, another and still stranger world met our eye as we gazed over the side, for suspended in those watery vaults floated the forms of the nursing mothers of the whales, and those that of their enormous girth seemed shortly to become mothers. The lake, as I have hinted, was to a considerable depth exceedingly transparent, and as human infants, while suckling, will calmly and fixedly gaze away from the breast, as if leading two different lives at the time, and, while yet drawing mortal nourishment, be still spiritually feasting upon some unearthly reminiscence, even so did the young of these whales seem looking up towards us, but not at us, as if we were but a bit of gulf-weed in their newborn sight. Floating on their sides, the mothers also seemed quietly eyeing us. One of these little infants, that from certain queer tokens seemed hardly a day old, might have measured some fourteen feet in length, and some six feet in girth. He was a little frisky, though as yet his body seemed scarce yet recovered from that irksome position it had so lately occupied in the maternal reticule, where, tail to head, and all ready for the final spring, the unborn whale lies bent like a tartar's bow. The delicate side fins and the palms of his flukes still freshly retained the pleated crumbled appearance of a baby's ears, newly arrived from foreign parts. "'Line! Line!' cried Queequeg, looking over the gunwale. "'Him fast! Him fast! Who line him? Who struck? Two whale, one big, one little!' "'What ails you, man?' cried Starbuck. "'Looky here!' said Queequeg, pointing down. As when the stricken whale, that from the tub has reeled out hundreds of fathoms of rope, as after deep sounding he floats up again, and shows the slackened curling line buoyantly rising and spiraling towards the air, so now Starbuck saw long coils of the umbilical cord of Madame Leviathan, by which the young cub seems still tethered to its dam. Not seldom in the rapid vicissitudes of the chase, this natural line with the maternal end loose becomes entangled with the hempen one, so that the cub is thereby trapped. Some of the subtlest secrets of the sea seem divulged to us in this enchanted pond. We saw young Leviathan amours in the deep. Footnote the sperm whale, as with all other species of the leviathan, but unlike most other fish, breeds indifferently at all seasons, after a gestation which may probably be set down at nine months, producing but one at a time, though in some few known instances giving birth to an Esau and a Jacob, a contingency provided for in suckling by two teats, curiously situated, one on each side of the anus, but the breasts themselves extend upwards from that. When, by chance, these precious parts in a nursing whale are cut by the hunter's lance, the mother's pouring milk and blood rivalingly discolor the sea for rods. The milk is very sweet and rich. It has been tasted by man. It might do well with strawberries. When overflowing with mutual esteem, the whales salute more hominum. End of footnote and thus, though surrounded by circle upon circle of consternations and affrights, did these inscrutable creatures at the centre freely and fearlessly indulge in all peaceful concernments, yea, serenely reveled in dalliance and delight. But even so, amid the tornadoed Atlantic of my being, do I myself still forever centrally disport in mute calm, and while ponderous planets of unwaning woe revolve round me, deep down and deep inland, there I still bathe me in eternal mildness of joy. Meanwhile, as we thus lay entranced, the occasional sudden frantic spectacles in the distance evince the activity of the other boats, still engaged in drugging the whales on the frontier of the host, or possibly carrying on the war within the first circle, where abundance of room and some convenient retreats were afforded them, but the sight of the enraged, drugged whales now and then blindly darting to and fro across the circles 
was nothing to what at last met our eyes. It is sometimes the custom, when fast to a whale more than commonly powerful and alert, to seek to hamstring him, as it were, by sundering or maiming his gigantic tail tendon. It is done by darting a short-handled cutting spade, to which is attached a rope for hauling it back again. A whale wounded, as we afterwards learned, in this part, but not effectually, as it seemed, had broken away from the boat, carrying along with him half of the harpoon line, and in the extraordinary agony of the wound he was now dashing among the revolving circles like the lone mounted desperado Arnold at the Battle of Saratoga, carrying dismay wherever he went. But agonizing as was the wound of this whale, and an appalling spectacle enough any way, yet the peculiar horror with which he seemed to inspire the rest of the herd was owing to a cause which at first the intervening distance obscured from us. But at length we perceived that by one of the unimaginable accidents of the fishery, this whale had become entangled in the harpoon line that he towed. He had also run away with the cutting spade in him, and while the free end of the rope attached to that weapon had permanently caught in the coils of the harpoon line round his tail, the cutting spade itself had worked loose from his flesh so that, tormented to madness, he was now churning through the water, violently flaying with his flexible tail, and tossing the keen spade about him, wounding and murdering his own comrades. This terrific object seemed to recall the whole herd from their stationary fright. First the whales, forming the margin of our lake, began to crowd a little, and tumble against each other, as if lifted by half-spent billows from afar. Then the lake itself began faintly to heave and swell. The submarine bridal chambers and nurseries vanished. In more and more contracting orbits the whales in the more central circles began to swim in thickening clusters. Yes, the long calm was departing. A low advancing hum was soon heard, and then, like the tumultuous masses of block ice when the great river Hudson breaks up in the spring, the entire host of whales came tumbling upon their inner centre, as if to pile themselves up in one common mountain. Instantly Starbuck and Queequeg changed places, Starbuck taking the stern. "'Oars! Oars!' he intensely whispered, seizing the helm. "'Grip your oars and clutch your souls now! My god, men, stand by! Shove him off, you, Queequeg! The whale there! Prick him! Hit him! Stand up! Stand up and stay so. Spring men, pull men, never mind their backs, scrape them, scrape away. The boat was now all but jammed between two vast black bulks, leaving a narrow dardanelles between their long lengths. But by desperate endeavor we at last shot into a temporary opening, then giving way rapidly, and at the same time earnestly watching for another outlet. After many similar hairbreadth escapes, we at last swiftly glided into what had just been one of the outer circles, but now crossed by random whales all violently making for one centre. This lucky salvation was cheaply purchased by the loss of Queequeg's hat, who, while standing in the bows to prick the fugitive whales, had his hat taken clean from his head by the air eddy made by the sudden tossing of a pair of broad flukes close by. Riotous and disordered as the universal commotion now was, it soon resolved itself into what seemed a systematic movement, for having clumped together at last in one dense body, they then renewed their onward flight with augmented fleetness. Further pursuit was useless, but the boats still lingered in their wake to pick up what drugged whales might be dropped astern, and likewise to secure one which Flask had killed and wafted. The waif is a pennoned pole, two or three of which are carried by every boat, and which, when additional game is at hand, are inserted upright into the floating body of a dead whale, both to mark its place on the sea, and also as token of prior possession, should the boats of any other ship draw near. The result of this lowering was somewhat illustrative of that sagacious saying in the fishery, the more whales, the less fish. Of all the drugged whales only one was captured. The rest contrived to escape for the time, but only to be taken, as will hereafter be seen, by some other craft than the Pequod. 
Chapter 88. Schools and Schoolmasters. The previous chapter gave account of an immense body or herd of sperm whales, and there was also then given the probable cause inducing those vast aggregations. Now, though such great bodies are at times encountered, yet, as must have been seen, even at the present day, small detached bands are occasionally observed, embracing from twenty to fifty individuals each. Such bands are known as schools. They generally are of two sorts, those composed almost entirely of females, and those mustering none but young, vigorous males, or bulls, as they are familiarly designated. In cavalier attendance upon the school of females, you invariably see a male of full-grown magnitude, but not old, who, upon any alarm, evinces his gallantry by falling in the rear and covering the flight of his ladies. In truth, this gentleman is a luxurious ottoman, swimming about over the watery world, surroundingly accompanied by all the solaces and endearments of the harem. The contrast between this ottoman and his concubines is striking, because while he is always of the largest leviathanic proportions, the ladies, even at full growth, are not more than one-third of the bulk of an average size male. They are comparatively delicate indeed, I dare say not to exceed half a dozen yards round the waist. Nevertheless, it cannot be denied that, upon the whole, they are hereditarily entitled to en bon point. It is very curious to watch this harem and its lord in their indolent ramblings. Like fashionables, they are forever on the move in leisurely search of variety. You meet them on the line in time for the full flower of the equatorial feeding season, having just returned, perhaps, from spending the summer in the northern seas, and so cheating summer of all unpleasant weariness and warmth. By the time they have lounged up and down the promenade of the equator a while, they start for the oriental waters in anticipation of the cool season there, and so evade the other excessive temperature of the year. When serenely advancing on one of these journeys, if any strange, suspicious sights are seen, my lord Whale keeps a wary eye on his interesting family. Should any unwarrantably pert young leviathan coming that way presume to draw confidentially close to one of the ladies, with what prodigious fury the Bashaw assails him and chases him away! High times, indeed, if unprincipled young rakes like him are to be permitted to invade the sanctity of domestic bliss. Though, do what the Bashaw will, he cannot keep the most notorious Lothario out of his bed, for, alas, all fish bed in common. As ashore, the ladies often cause the most terrible duels among their rival admirers, just so with the whales, who sometimes come to deadly battle, and all for love. They fence with their long lower jaws, sometimes locking them together, and so striving for the supremacy, like elks that warringly interweave their antlers. Not a few are captured having deep scars of these encounters, furrowed heads, broken teeth, scalloped fins, and in some instances wrenched and dislocated mouths. But supposing the invader of domestic bliss to betake himself away at the first rush of the harem's lord, then it is very diverting to watch that lord. Gently he insinuates his vast bulk among them again, and revels there a while, still in tantalizing vicinity to young Lothario, like pious Solomon devoutly worshipping among his thousand concubines. Granting other whales to be in sight, the fishermen will seldom give chase to one of these grand Turks, for these grand Turks are too lavish of their strength, and hence their unctuousness is small. As for the sons and daughters they beget, why those sons and daughters must take care of themselves, at least with only the maternal help, for like certain other omnivorous roving lovers that might be named, my lord Whale has no taste for the nursery, however much for the bower, and so, being a great traveller, he leaves his anonymous babies all over the world, every baby an exotic. In good time, nevertheless, as the ardour of youth declines, as years and dumps increase, as reflection lends her solemn pauses, in short, as a general lassitude overtakes the sated Turk, then a love of ease and virtue supplants the love for maidens, 
our Ottoman enters upon the impotent, repentant, admonitory stage of life, forswears, disbands the harem, and, grown to an exemplary, sulky old soul, goes about all alone among the meridians and parallels, saying his prayers, and warning each young leviathan from his amorous errors. Now, as the harem of Wales is called by the fisherman a school, so is the lord and master of that school technically known as the schoolmaster. It is therefore not in strict character, however admirably satirical, that after going to school himself he should then go abroad inculcating not what he learned there, but the folly of it. His title, schoolmaster, would very naturally seem derived from the name bestowed upon the harem itself, but some have surmised that the man who first thus entitled this sort of Ottoman whale must have read the memoirs of Vidocq, and informed himself what sort of a country schoolmaster that famous Frenchman was in his younger days, and what was the nature of those occult lessons he inculcated into some of his pupils. The same secludedness and isolation to which the schoolmaster whale betakes himself in his advancing years is true of all aged sperm whales. Almost universally, a lone whale, as a solitary leviathan is called, proves an ancient one. Like venerable, moss-bearded Daniel Boone, he will have no one near him but nature herself, and her he takes to wife in the wilderness of waters, and the best of wives she is, though she keeps so many moody secrets. The schools composing none but young and vigorous males, previously mentioned, offer a strong contrast to the harem schools. For while those female whales are characteristically timid, the young males, or forty-barrel bulls, as they call them, are by far the most pugnacious of all leviathans, and proverbially the most dangerous to encounter, excepting those wondrous grey-headed grizzled whales sometimes met, and these will fight you like grim fiends exasperated by a penal gout. The forty-barrel bull schools are larger than the harem schools. Like a mob of young collegians, they are full of fight, fun, and wickedness, tumbling round the world at such a reckless, rollicking rate, that no prudent underwriter would insure them any more than he would a riotous lad at Yale or Harvard. They soon relinquish this turbulence, though, and when about three-fourths grown, break up and separately go about in quest of settlements, that is, harems. Another point of difference between the male and female schools is still more characteristic of the sexes. Say you strike a forty-barrel bull, poor devil, all his comrades quit him. But strike a member of the harem school, and her companions swim around her with every token of concern, sometimes lingering so near her, and so long, as themselves to fall a prey. 